Well, it's all kicking off. Let's begin. Now, of course, ever since Labour came to power in July, because no one really wanted Rishi, did they? Labour's approval rating has basically plummeted ever since, hasn't it? With all the wonderful in their eyes policies that they want to inflict upon us all. In fact, their approval ratings have gone down so low, I think they're probably about the size of a midget dwarf, if that indeed is possible. But it seems they're not too happy about it, and the infighting has already started on quite a few issues. I say that because according to the first article, Angela Rayne is reportedly in a row with Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds about the hard left reforms with fears from less left-wing members of the government that they could put companies off hiring. So what is going on then? Well, apparently Labour's manifesto committed a new deal for working people. No doubt they were proud with what they were suggesting, but... Within this plan, which includes such things as rights to flexible working hours, ban and zero contractors and and fire and rehire, which don't sound too bad, but within all that, it says that the row has been sparked by Miss Rayner pushing up to guarantee that all workers the same rights from day one, including parental leave, sick pay and protection from unfair dismissal, which, if you think about it, could cost companies quite a bit of money, couldn't it? Especially if you've got someone on probation in the first six months probationary period, let's say. They then turn up to work less than Kia Starmer at a toy convention. It looks like I was right because it says that businesses are already warning of the cost and the regulator burden the bill will create, with one source telling the Times the bill is like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, and the only nuts are going to be cracked are more than likely the businesses from day one, aren't they, eh? The business secretary, though, he's apparently pushing for a nine-month wait before workers get the additional rights, which he also reportedly wants a probation period of a year before someone can take their employer to a tribunal for unfair dismissal. And a Whitehall source told The Telegraph that day one rights is proving very difficult. And whilst you think when you that this business secretary might have a few brain cells between the ears with what he's just said, but he then goes on to say that the legal right to work from home will boost productivity. According to this article, which if I remember rightly during a pandemic, people working from home was a massive pain in the bum, especially if you had to call them up. How long were you on hold for? And then you heard some screaming kid in the background and they couldn't do their job very productively at all, in my opinion, quite a lot of the time. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm sure there'll be people who work from home who can do their job perfectly well. However, it does make me wonder how long it will be before people start to do their jobs with Netflix on in the background or something like that if they're allowed to work from home all the time, it seems. And making something like that a legal right is surely going to diminish their productivity even further, in my opinion. Because let's face it, how long it would be before they ring up the boss and instead of saying, I can't come to work today, they'll say, oh, um, um, I can't get out of bed today. Or worse, would ring up the boss and say, I'm not coming in today, I'm working from home instead. And if the boss needs you in for a meeting, then that might be quite problematic, especially if you have to go somewhere with them to it. And no doubt, of course, they'll say, oh, that's okay, you can use Zoom calls, but what about if the internet goes down? Which, yes, admittedly, is a bit of a long shot, but let's face it, there are quite often problems, aren't there, with people breaking up on Zoom calls and things like that, eh? But that isn't the only issue that there's civil war about. No, apparently, Labour, let's just say, a little bit displeased about people voting against Robin the Elderly. Oh, sorry, I mean, um, cutting the winter fuel allowance. And I've sent all those MPs who voted against them a bit of a nasty warning, and in fact... It could be quite problematic for them if they do it again, they say. I say that because according to this article, it says Sir Keir Starmer, or Keir Starmer, it's no sir to me, I'm afraid, has been condemned by a Labour MP after it emerged that whips have warned last week's winter fuel payment rebels that their careers will be held back as a result of their actions. And that, in my opinion, is just absolutely disgraceful. It seems, doesn't it, that as some sort of dictatorship, you will do this whether you like it or not. And yes, I do understand that governments do have whips telling MPs to do things. However, there are times when governments give MPs a free vote. And I personally think that something like this should have been a free vote for MPs. Because let's face it, it doesn't look very good at all, does it, for any MP to say that they voted against cutting something which is bound to affect quite a lot of people. And to say that their careers will be held back presumably suggests that they'll be doing something much more than just firing them or chucking them out of the party or whatever. And therefore, in my eyes, it's gone further than what they should be allowed to do because it sounds like they're actually going to come after them even after they've left, doesn't it, eh? 
Although hopefully that is not the case. And in that letter to the rebels, the government whip says, Now dealt warnings, it says that the MP's future behaviour is being monitored. And they said they will be denied privileges, which, let's face it, as their MPs, could be quite a lot of things, couldn't it? Including such things as expenses, I'm guessing. And one of these so-called privileges they could lose includes losing any potential help to secure places on wait for this. The House of Commons Select Committee. <gasps> oh no! Let's face it, who would really want to be part of that in the first place, eh? It also emerged apparently that Whips warned Labour MPs that they were not allowed to discuss the winter fuel vote, nor its aftermath with journalists. Well, that in my opinion goes a bit further than just telling them how to vote. And one of these rebel MPs have blasted the party's response in the route, telling the Guardian that the government has misjudged the depth of anger around the policy. What well, no crap, Sherlock. And get this, whilst Labour pushed the claim that only 12 MPs had failed to vote, it is believed the number of rebels was in fact much higher. And yes, that more than likely was, because let's face it, I think there was about 300 and something back in it, if I remember rightly. However... The number of Labour MPs is over 400 odds, isn't it? So that is surely a lot more than 12 MPs, if my maths is correct. Unless, of course, Diane Abbott is doing the Labour maths. And speaking of Diane Abbott, but she appears to be also in a bit of a civil war with Labour. And I say that because, according to this article, she claims that Keir Starmer treated her as a non-person. Which, if you're Prime Minister, surely you should be treating all your MPs Pretty well, shouldn't you? Because let's face it, they all got the vote, didn't they, to be in your government and therefore helped you win the election. But apparently it's all sparked off after a Tory donor made racist comments about it, which no one should be doing at all, shouldn't they? Especially in this day and age, because we've got these things called anti-discrimination laws. But anyway, the MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington claimed she was treated badly during the fallout after Tory donor Frank Hester made racist comments about her last year. And in an interview with BBC Newsnight, Abbott said Starman never reached out to her personally and did treat me as a non-person. She added, if somebody was threatening to have you shot, you would have felt your party would have offered you more support, given you advice on safety and security, even kind of commiserated with you. And none of that happened. But just what have Labour said about it? Well, a government spokesperson told Metro that Keir Starmer has great respect for Diane Abbott. And she continues to be an inspiration for many. There is no doubt that she has received the most abuse of any MP just because of her gender and the colour of her skin. And that is completely reprehensible and wrong. But it does say here though that the party including Keir Starmer vocally condemned Frank Hannister's vile comments and reached out to Diane at the time to offer support. So which is it then? Either he did or he didn't. I think at the end of the day, they're the only two people who know. But if she's gone to the papers about it, I'm guessing he might need to reach out a little bit more. And on his face out in the meantime, I guess he's probably a bit preoccupied with limit and damage control, shall we say, with all the not very nice policies that he's more than likely going to inflict upon us in due course.